All right, gentlemen, I've got Ray Bayat here. Uh, Ray is a friend. He's a front row dad. He is uh, uh, an incredible family man, um, wildly successful in business. And I'm, I wanted to have this conversation with Ray for a number of reasons. And one is I want you guys to meet a man who I consider to be one of the most epic humans walking the earth today. I want you to feel Ray's energy, his, what I'm going to refer to as this like insatiable appetite for growth. I want you to hear some of his stories of, of how he travels with his family and, and the number of countries that he and his wife and his children have visited is quite impressive. And maybe we'll poke around at, you know, some of the stories of how his family gives to their community. And they do it in some really unique ways. One of which is these events that they host at their at their home, they're quite large. Like there's a lot of people that come and um, and with some pretty incredible guests, guest speakers. And and uh, I, I think Ray is also the type of person who, when I'm running events and I look out in the audience and I see Ray there, I'm like, this is gonna be a good event. Mm -hmm. You know, just because I know when Ray's in the room that good things are gonna happen. And I love when I see that, you know, if I pair Ray up with somebody, they have a conversation or Ray's in a small group, I'm like, that group's going to be taken care of because Ray's there and Ray will be the one that asks the questions. He'll be the one that opens up and shares stories. He'll, he'll be vulnerable and real. And I think that is a brand of his being very authentic in his, in his conversations. Uh, people trust Ray. And I've heard nothing but incredible things from the men in our community. And so we've got him here today to explore what it means to be a dad and what it means to be Ray. And my hope, gentlemen, for all of you out there listening is that through hearing his stories, you'll capture some ideas. Hey, maybe I do that with my family. Maybe, maybe I try that out. And not that we want to be copycats of each other, but we do want to be inspired by each other. And I think that if you could walk away with one little action today, that could change everything for you. And that's always my hope. So Ray, welcome to the show, man. Uh, I'm pumped about this. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it, John. Yeah, man, it's easy. Uh, I love the kind of introductions that I don't have to read, you know, that I just get a chance to speak from the heart. And that feels really good. Let's um let's take this a little bit further though, so the guys get to know you and and maybe what you can do, Ray, is just tell us about your family, and yeah. also tell us how you put food on the table, okay. um you know and 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 what what you're passionate about these days. So, yeah, yeah. tell tell us about you and your family, brother. Sure. Uh, so I've I've been married. Uh, this August will be 21 years to Catherine. Um, and. Uh, uh, just a quick story. I'll never forget. I saw her at a party. I talked to her for a couple minutes and she walked away. And I said, in my mind to myself, that's the girl I'm going to marry. Wow. I just knew it. So um, she's an incredible, incredible mother. Um, I'm just so fortunate. Um, so we have a 14-year-old daughter, Darina. And she's all about dance, theater, and music. And my son, Dara, is 11. And he's all about sports. And he plays club soccer. Uh, we've, uh, we live in Frisco, Texas. We've lived here in 12, uh, 12 years now. We moved from California, uh, spent the majority of my life in California. And my brother and I started a shopping center investment company, uh, back in 2001. Uh, he passed away and now I'm running that company. Uh, we specialize buying in shopping centers that are mismanaged, poorly leased and distressed. Um, and honestly that I don't really see myself focused and my value proposition just in shopping centers. Um, my personal core focus and the company's focus is just to bring value to individual lives. Um, every interaction I have, whether it's in business or the doorman or the waiter, um, I always want them to you know, walk away feeling that they, they got some value in that interaction. And so that's my mindset. Um, and part of it is really coming from my wife as well, because that's the way she lives. Um, she loves pouring into people, um, creating experiences. Um, and that's why she manages all of our travel. Uh, and because she loves creating experiences for our children, that's cool. uh, for me. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, when we host people at our home, she loves all the details and everything is thought through. So when someone goes away, 
um, they feel like they, they not only got value in attending the function, but they see some things that they learn from her. So that that's why I'm so lucky to be married to her. Dude, let, let's talk about those events right away. Uh -huh. It's a beautiful, it's a, it's a, you provided a transition into that for perfectly. So sure. thank you. But yeah, where did they start, man? What was the impetus behind these events? And then we'll get into maybe what some of them have been and who's, you know, who's sure. been there. So um, it started really maybe within the three to four first years of our marriage. And my wife and I were talking um, she loves hosting people. We had we hosted dinner parties all the time. And the conversations around the dinner tables were always really deep and authentic and vulnerable. And so we found that people really connected well when we hosted dinner parties. And then it kind of transitioned into like this big dream of like the impact we want to have, both of us. Um, and she came up with this idea and she called it Be Inspired because we want to inspire people. Um, and so we tested it out, like sort of not um, with a lot of thought. Um, and it started kind of developing some 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 momentum. And then it really started with Dane, um, who we hosted and he did the dream journal. Um, and we got a ton of feedback and how wonderful it was. So we host, um, we're actually we invite like over 200 people, but typically we're somewhere between 60 to 75 people attend. It's our home and we want to keep it at home for the time being because it's an intimate environment. Um, so we move, you know, furniture around and create space. Um, and it started with Dane. And then we've had Hal Runkle, Screen Free Parenting, uh, author of Screen Free, who was on the fr Front Row Dads podcast. And we just had um, Jessica Leahy, who wrote the book, The Gift of Failure. Um, and we've reached out to multiple others and, you know, they've declined or... Um, the fee was just astronomical. Um, so it's a combination of um, our friends, our neighbors, uh, front row dad members, go abundance members, um, people that we want to have an impact on. Uh, and we're going to continue to do it. Uh, my wife just, it lights her up when she plans this whole thing. Um, and uh, it, 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 the feedback is amazing from, from the people that attend. Do the speakers, um, do you just cut them loose for an hour or how, yeah. how is it structured? Yeah, yeah. so typically 6 to 7.30, it's it's food and, and wine and beer. Uh, and then 7.30, the speakers start. And typically it's about an hour and a half or so that they speak. And then they linger, answer questions, connect with the guests. Um, and I'll give you a perfect example. When Hal spoke... Uh, he was truly amazing. Um, many people hung around uh, to want to talk to him. I bet. And a couple kind of cornered him. And like the gentleman, like kind of like basically boxed out everybody. <laughs> he wanted his wife to have like one-on-one -on -one time with Hal. And they spoke for about five minutes. And afterwards, um, he said it was that five minutes was the most significant thing that had happened in their marriage of oh. 15 years and to this day he's still sending me texts and thanking me for making that connection um because his wife has benefited tremendously from a five-minute conversation with Hal. and when i tell my wife that god she just lights up she loves that impact that she has on people just a simple five-minute conversation with a, a speaker and someone's trajectory of their life changes that's amazing uh, I want to use this as an opportunity to talk about your childhood for a second, because mm -hmm. I'm always wondering when somebody like yourself creates these inc incredible events, they bring people together. And I know you're giving your wife a, a lot of credit here, which is awesome. I love the praise and and uh, acknowledgement of that. So if she ever listens, I just want her to, that's, you, you know, wonderful um, that you that you shine the light. Mm -hmm. I'm also wondering, and you maybe you could speak for her also if you want, but going back to your childhood, do you remember moments where other adults created a sense of community, brought people together, hosted events, um, could be small or large, but did, was that modeled for you at a young age? Yeah, so it's, it's really fascinating you bring this up because I just, yesterday I was talking to somebody about this. Um, growing up, 
my, I, I was born in Iran and uh, I, I left Iran right during the revolution when I was nine years old. And my dad was a workaholic, so I rarely saw him. But what he did model, and I loved, and, I, and I, maybe some of this, I hadn't even connected the dots, but maybe this, this is really the, the reason. He loved hosting people. At, we had a farm, and uh, he would just gather all of my aunts, uncles, cousins, the extended family, always at this farm. And um, I remember it, it wasn't you know a, a rather large farm um, sort of house or anything. Uh, and so... People would just lay on the ground and just go to sleep like you could just from one side of the room to the other. And it was always just a lot of laughter. Um, aunts and uncles and cousins playing cards and backgammon. It's like if somebody asked me, what's your best childhood memories? It's exactly that. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one instance where he rented a beach house um, and there was probably over 50. And that is like my number one childhood memory because it was like a whole week of absolute laughter and joy and fun and connection with my extended relatives but maybe that is really what modeled it and started it yeah <laughs> I, it's fun to think back um when i was when i was younger i remember uh waking up early and kind of decorating the living room and making menus because i desperately wanted my parents to come out and be like you're the best kid ever. You know, I wanted to blow them away. I, I was so interested in their reaction if I like took care of the environment. And I could still see that showing up for me when I run retreats or live events today, like wanting to set the room so that people can have an experience. Yeah. Um, and I think that was probably born when I was a kid. These, 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 these anchors get set very young. Uh, I love hearing that. It also, hearing that story, right, make it, I'm prompted to think, how am I creating that for my kids? Exactly. When's my next family gathering, friend gathering? That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, what, what, in what other ways was your dad a warning or an example for you? How did, how, how did he, you know, ultimately shape the type of father you are today? God, so many ways. Um, but I only really understood that when um, I worked on myself. So mm -hmm. I had a, he was very much an alpha male. It was my way or no way. You're a child. Your opinion doesn't matter. Um, shut up and do as I say. Um, it was very hard to connect with my dad. And he was a workaholic. So growing up, I had a lot of challenges in connecting with him. But it in my late twenties is when I really started working, um, extensively on myself. Um, and his father had passed away when he was five years old. So once I came to the realization that my expectations of him were unrealistic because he didn't know how to be a father, you, mm -hmm. you know, you learn how to be a father from your father. And so he, at five years old, he lost his. Once I, I recognized that, we started connecting at a really deep level. I set aside my ego and it was magical, uh, particularly the last couple of years of his life as he battled cancer. And I was his caretaker. I'm, I'm the kind of personality, like if something's going on, I need to figure out how to solve it or assist. So I was in every single uh, doctor's appointment I, in chemo. I got to know so much about cancer. Um, that even some of the nurses started calling me Dr. Bayad, even though you know, I'm not a doctor. Um, I was actually even in the operating room with him one time. Um, so my connections really deepened towards the end of life uh, for him. And um, the the number, several things, two things that I can think of that really he modeled. One is absolute determination and persistence in overcoming challenges. Mm -hmm. Never talked about it, never realized it, never really... Um, told me any stories around it. I just observed him. Um, and, and that goes to a saying that, um, I, I don't know if you know Justin Bad. I follow him on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. He's got a saying that is stuck in my mind and I parent around this all the time. Far more is caught than taught. Yeah. And that's exactly what you know, my dad did. Um, the other is he never asked us, forced us, talked to us about reading whatsoever but he modeled it. 
And one of the uh, reflections that I had um, just a couple, maybe a year and a half ago was, I, I love reading and my goal is to, you know, have my, my goal was always to have a library in my own home with books. And my goal was to read 10,000 books by the time I die. And I was reflecting, you know, where, that, the, where did that come from? And it goes back to observing my dad for hours on his worn out leather recliner, kicking his legs up and for hours just having a book. Um, and so he modeled that for me as well. Um, so those are the things that I look back and as I've grown and I've matured and I have more wisdom and I've set aside my ego, uh, that's what I'm coming to realize is, yes, I didn't have that close of a relationship with them growing up, but it was beautiful. It was magical. I learned a lot. He modeled great behavior, um, great characteristics. And so um, I'm, I wouldn't trade my childhood and my you know, what I experienced with my father for anything. Was there anything else as a kid that happened in your life that shaped who you are today that was significant in shaping the the Ray Bayat of this moment? A lot, a lot. Um, and again, um, I, as I mature and, and um, recognize how critical all those things were. When I was living my childhood, I wanted my life to be anything other than what it was. And now I wouldn't trade it. So obviously, um, absolute mayhem in when I was, you know, nine years old. Um, the revolution in Iran, my, my father's actually in the United States seeking medical help. He almost died in the hospital in the U.S. He had a pulmonary embolism. And the revolution's happening in Iran. Bur uh, buildings are burning down, tanks in the street, dead soldiers I observed, you know, gunfire. Um, and my parents never really comforted me or talked to me about it and, you know, kind of explain what was going on. So I was in the dark, but I'm observing and seeing all this. And my dad finally gets better, flies back. We pack four bags, lock the door to the house, go to the airport. The whole you know country's trying to leave. We wait 24 hours um, to catch a flight and we go to France temporarily um, because my dad thought it's going to blow over. We can go back to Iran. Well, it never, it never happened. And so then we had to make adjustments of where we go from here. What do we do? And my dad came from very, very humble beginnings, um, self-made. We had an upper middle class life in Iran. He owned a lot of land, uh, orchards and farm, just completely gone. And we wow. Had to, and, and so we had to kind I of- I can't even imagine. Oh, it was- Wow. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and so it, all those things. And then I get to the U.S. and we're in the midst of the hostage crisis and I don't speak English. And, you know, some of the kids get to know that, oh, this this kid's from Iran. And so I'm sitting in the bus um, and a kid just sucker punch me, uh, punches me in the back of the head. And I just got to swallow my pride. I can't say anything. I don't know what to say because I don't speak English. Um, or I sit in class and the teacher at least what I believe she did is say, hey, we have a new student. Why don't you tell me, you know, tell the student, um, the class about yourself. I didn't speak a word of English. I didn't know what to say. So then all these kids start laughing, right? And so all these things really impacted me to become an introvert. Um, uh, another instance was a kid, again, because of the hostage crisis, threw a towel over my head and just started pummeling me and punching me, right? Um, uh, thank, his name was Brian Hendricks. Wherever he is, I appreciate what he did. Um, because now when I look back, all those things, and I, I have this expression, and I, maybe somebody else came up with it, but your adversity is your advantage. Mm -hmm. So the more adversity I faced, the better um, I am today. Um, so all those things in childhood, you know, have impacted me. Um, and then just my dad and who he was and his characteristics, his alpha male personality. And then mom, who was always gaslighting everything and saying, oh, it'll be OK. Or don't worry about that. Don't worry about your dad. You know, he's a nice man. Don't don't, you know, forget what he said or, you know, forget that he's yelling at the top of his lungs. It's just so she never validated any feelings I had. She did yeah. the best she could. Yeah. She's an incredible woman and, and, and I love her. But. You know, these are the challenges that I had as a child growing up. And I was also the youngest by far. My my sister is 15 years older, and then my brother was uh, 11 years older. Yeah. So all those things have shaped me, and I'm so wow. glad I've experienced every bit of it. 
when did you, it, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear you say that, you know, that, uh, that I see you living very much a, this is happening for me, not to me type of life. Uh, and I love that level of responsibility. Um, because as a kid, things do happen to you. It's later in life that we get to rewrite the story and, and say they happened for us. Um, but as children, we could certainly, you could argue you were a victim of violence in that moment, but you didn't let that story define you or create a vengeful, hateful heart. You, 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 you decided to shape that story in a way that serves you. And I think that's what, what separates oftentimes the, the traumas that create our new superpowers and the traumas that uh, we, we believe are the ones that hold us back in life. So I love that. Where did you... Would you consider yourself to be an extrovert now? Yeah. yeah. So where did that, where was the switch from introvert to extrovert? Um, I owe everything to my cousin. Uh, so I was 22, lost. Had to convince my last professor in college to change my uh, um, grade from a C minus to a C so I could graduate with a 2.0. But... Um, and I was just floating. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And my uh, my cousin uh, had gone through the Dale Carnegie training. Yeah. He turned me on to, uh, at that time, if you remember, um, tapes, audio tapes. And I started listening to Robert Schuller or Nightingale. Um, yeah. And, and that really put me on the path uh, to personal development um, and focusing on myself and getting better every day. Uh, and as I gained confidence... Um, it just started happening. And honestly, I, I think it's really exponentially grown in the last four or five years, uh, particularly because I joined Front Row Dads and GoBundance. Uh, I'm surrounded by very high performing people um, who are just as vulnerable. They're amazing leaders. And I can look up to these individuals. I can learn from them. Um, and, uh, you know, Dr. Kelly is a big... Um, uh, you know, name in our circles. If you've read Lovable, he always talks about, you know, the three um, sort of trajectory or three uh, ways of growth. First, you got to find your worthiness and your belonging and then your purpose. Well, I found my worthiness, but I didn't have belonging. And then I joined Front Row Dads and Go Abundance. I find my belonging. I find my people, my tribe who elevate me. And then now I have my purpose. Um, I want to mm. bring value to everybody. Every interaction I have, um, all my investors, uh, my kids. Uh, so uh, now I have more confidence and I'm more extrovert than I've ever been. But it's a progression. I think it's just what happens in life. You build, 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 and you build the base. And every year you're getting better. And if you do that, magical things happen. So you make sure I heard the story right. So you had, you had it was a college professor. This is graduating college yeah, yeah so this is what's fascinating to me and i think it's so like it's so beneficial for a parent to hear this because we can start to think as parents that if if our kids don't get good grades this year or whatever like they're you know as my wife would say like they're gonna be living under a bridge you know like their lives are ruined and i i, I it's so comforting to be reminded that we all hit our our grit, our different growth spurts, mental growth spurts, spiritual growth spurts, you know, the evolution of our being at different paces. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard what you just described is like, it happened my junior year of high school, or it all clicked for me my sophomore year of college, or it didn't click for me until I was in my master's program. You know, that, that was my dad's story. Like he would, I remember him telling me that it really clicked for him in his master's program something changed for him. That's all fascinating. I mean, that, that was kind of my path too, where um, it was really difficult until I, you and I share this same story, man. I was, I bought Tony Robbins. I don't even remember if they were tapes or CDs at the time, but I remember it was early 2000s when I found it. I was in my, I remember where I was in my bedroom and I was watching Tony Robbins on TV and I was like half this is probably bullshit. And then the other half of me is like, but wait a minute, something feels right about this. And then I had this thought, which I've shared many times was it went from, is it worth it to buy the CDs to am I worth finding out? Yeah. 
And the answer was, I'm worth it. I, re- I can't even tell you how courageous of a phone call that was for me. I'm like, I'm the guy buying CDs off the TV from the from yeah. the dude being like, I will show you how to do it. And half of me is like, I'm the dumbest person in the world for ordering these CDs. And the other person, the other part of me feels like I'm the smartest person. And then funny enough, Ray, I was talking this morning. This is so coincidental with a guy, my really good buddy, Jamie, Jamie Bogger, who I started Front Row Foundation with in 2006. Mm -hmm. I ran my first ultra marathon with him and we worked together in the early 2000s. He was around when I bought these these CDs from Tony. Mm -hmm. And I remember listening to them every day to and from the office. And one day I get to the office and I'm talking to him and maybe I'm sharing, maybe I'm telling him what I learned or whatever. And he goes, John, you're a far more fascinating human when you're learning. And dude, it was like, I got knighted in that moment, you know? And I was like, that's it. It's locked in. Like he just, that affirmation, that validation, him seeing me, him witnessing me, him reflecting back to me, what I knew to be true was a catalyst in my life. And I just went all in from that point. I was, I got bit by the bug. I followed down the rabbit hole. I went all in and, and life was, and Tony would say life was never the same after that, you know? I 100% agree with you. So in 2008, uh, I went to Tony Robbins UPW event in Los Angeles and I took my sister, my brother-in-law, my niece, my wife, and my mother. Um, and I loved it. And instantaneously when they announced the mastery program, I walked to, You're the, back in. The, I walked to the back of the room, no hesitation whatsoever. Yeah. 20 grand for my wife and I right there and then. And, and, you know, back then 20 grand was a lot of money. And this is like March of 2008. So, you know, the economy was just kind of yeah altering already. And my wife's like, you're crazy. And I said, <laughs> oh, we need this. And I can, I tell this pe- uh, to people all the time, going through the Tony Robbins mastery program with my wife has been instrumental in our relationship. It has been powerful because um, we speak the same language. Uh, we learn together. We never sat together. We always sat apart. We had our own experiences, but would always come back. If, if anybody ever has any doubts about the program, I would highly suggest you do it with your spouse. It is incredibly, incredibly powerful. Yeah, that's so great, man. I love that. And I love that. Uh, I I love today that you are as extroverted as you are, Ray. I really appreciate you, the effort that you put to to create for yourself and others. I remember being at one of our events, and I turned on the music, and I was like in the middle of the circle, and I think I started dancing, and then did you just jumped up and you came into the circle and you started dancing, and I'm like, these are the moments, man, when you see somebody express themselves with confidence and. And when they are squeezing the juice out of life in the best way, um, it's, it makes me want to lock arms with those guys and just commit and do life together. So it's really been cool to see that. Let's that, go. That was a magical moment for me as well, John. Yeah. Um, because when I came to that retreat, I was really, really struggling with um, uh, my mother who uh, was going through you know, Alzheimer uh, mm. and, and debating of what to do and how to care for her. And it was just a really, really rough patch. And so that moment when that music came on, I just felt compelled to release this energy and started jumping up and down. And again, it was one of those moments that you'll never forget. And um, so I appreciate you doing that. And I look forward to more music at uh, the event. Yeah, Yeah, man. And and now I'm on the hook for for dancing. That's right. Um, Now I'm on the hook for dancing. Which, by the way, I don't think my wife's going to listen to this episode. So it's safe to say I had a private lesson today, um, and I'm and I'm I'm thrilled that I did it. Like I I'm on the path. So Definitely. and but for the, okay, so for context for anybody listening, that's like, what is John talking about? I had shared with our VIP group that um, uh, I had come to the realization that my wife really wants me to learn how to lead on the dance floor. She wants me to dance with her. And I have not answered that call for years and years and years, but now I am. And if I do not, 
uh, fulfill the mission in the next six months of learning how to lead effectively on the dance floor, I have a consequence, which is that at the Front Row Dad live event in December, which is our big event here in Austin, that I will need to dance in a leotard with a ribbon an entire song. <laughs> so Accountability I, is the best. I am committed to hitting my October goal of leading on the dance floor. Um, some serious motivation there for me. There you go. Um, Ray, let's talk about life today. Sure. And what I want to ask you is about your, your high and your low that you could share with me. And I also want to say to the guys listening out there that the context of this is that oftentimes at our events and around my dinner table, I will ask people I care about, my kids, my brothers, hey, give me a high and a low. It's how we start our weekly L10 meeting in Front Road Ads amongst our staff too. Right. Um, I, we actually do high-low props. So let's do that today. Let's do high-low props. Here's what it would be. Um, you know this, Ray, but I'm saying this for everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, some high point moment in any one of our six pillars. Okay. What feels challenging or or a low um, that's you know tougher on your energy, and right. then if you could, and I know I'm throwing you on the spot here. I didn't prep you for any of this, but props to somebody, and it could be anybody. It could be somebody in front row dads in your life, in your family. It doesn't matter. Just a person that you would want to acknowledge. Right. So, high low props, man. What? Sure. I would love to hear. God, I'm, there's so many highs right now. I'm just in such a great season of fatherhood. Um, there's so many that I could talk about, but um, I'll just tell you the one that I had last night. Um, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I'm, I'm still, uh, it's tough for me. So my, my son's 11 year old son's best friend passed away two weeks ago in an accident. Um, and we got to know this boy really well. He came over to our house, um, often, uh, and my son Dara went over to his, we got to know his parents really well. Uh, and I've gone through a lot of funerals, including my father, and my brother, but, um, going through Knox's funeral was one of the toughest things that I've done in my life. Mm. And my son is still impacted by it. And um, on Saturday, he broke down and crying. Um, on Sunday, he did as well. And um, last night, uh, his soccer uh, practice got canceled. And so I got a chance to just spend some downtime with him. So he was in his room. Uh, and I just went and laid down on the ground next to him um, and just hugged him and kissed him. And... Uh, kind of kidded around with him, you know, wrestled uh, with him. And I said, hey, bud, I just want to know how you're doing. Um, and so I walked him through, you know, the stages of grief. And I said, it's okay if you're angry. It's okay if you're in denial. It's okay if you're sad. Um, and I just felt like I connected with him at such a deep level. Um and he, he got talking about another friend of his on his soccer team. And um, and I said, do you feel supported? Do you feel like I am there for you? And he said, dad, amazing. All the time, I feel like you're there for me. And that's just, that's just magical, man. Um, God, a great moment last night. I just, I loved and cherished every minute I spent on the, on the floor with him, just hugging him and kissing him. So that's my high for, you know, my recent high, but I could, I could go on for like so long because I'm having a literally every day with, with my kids. Yeah. Well, let's take a moment before we get into what's challenging. Um, and I, I want to just reflect something back and I want to give a moment of pause to just let that sit for a second, because that's a really beautiful share. Um, one, I, I do hope and I can see on the clock, I think we will have time to get into some of these other great moments that you're experiencing. So I would like to explore that. Sure. Um, I want to also just acknowledge that, man, so difficult to find the right words, to find the right questions or stories or or even actions in moments where people we love are suffering with a loss like that. And what I just pictured though, was you just being there. And 
in what felt intuitively to you and you trusted yourself to lean in the way that you knew you needed to right then and just show up. And, and to me, that's the biggest thing is lean in. Yeah. And you could say it a lot of different ways, show up, lean in, engage, whatever term you want to use to that, to describe that it's, but that's the role of a father. Yeah. That's the most important piece of it. And yeah, you'll probably mess up some of the things. You might say something you shouldn't have said, or you should have asked a question that maybe you didn't. There's a lot of those things that we can punish ourselves with. Um, at least I do. Yeah. And, and yet in those moments when you can just trust yourself and lean in, um, and people feel like, you know, our, our, our kids feel like we're there for them. God, Ray, that's so awesome, man. Wonderful. I just want to honor you for that. And also honor you for have, having created a life where you can do that. This is where the business part is so important. Cause like, why, why do we want to talk about business? It, it's not, not, not as interested in helping somebody going from making 3 million to 4 million. I don't think that's going to really increase the quality of their life a lot. I hope they do. Great. Yes. I'm not going to, I, like, wonderful. I'll high five you. I'll celebrate that with you. But I really think that at the core of it, it's like creating a life of abundance so that you can be with your kids in that moment, that you, you do know how to have boundaries at your work. You do have, you know how to outsource, you know how to have a team, you know how to have multiple people working on projects so that you can be with your kids. And that's the part I want to honor you is like all the effort you've put into building a life so that you could be there in that moment, yeah. even taking care of yourself, taking care of your health, taking like all there's a thousand there's a million things that you've done little things along the way that have allowed you to be there so i just want to acknowledge you for that I appreciate it thank you john how about um and and by the way i think there is a challenge of course in what you just shared but i want to give you space for something else that's particularly sure. challenging for you right now what what's hard so the the hardest the most challenging thing um as a parent for me uh has been for a while and continues to be that my kids just constantly bicker and, <laughs> and it's um, and I attributed both my wife and I are the youngest by many years. So we didn't grow up with a sibling that's near us where we fought a lot. So we were almost like a um, only child. Mm. And so coming from that background and seeing my kids just constantly bicker and fight um, is I would say probably about the only thing that, pushes me to my limit and I lose my cool. Um, and so I give you a perfect example on Mother's Day on Sunday, I had talked to the kids for multiple days in advance and even Sunday morning. And I said, today is mom's day. Let's make it special. Let's please be friendly to one another and kind and loving. Sure enough, you know, we're at the restaurant having brunch. They bring a, a rose for my wife and the two kids start fighting over the roads. And so it just escalates. Um, and so I have to, you know, check myself a lot in terms of my anger around mm -hmm. this bickering and constant fighting. I mean, literally one could say the sky is green and they start fighting. I mean, it's yeah. just ridiculous, the stuff that they fight over. Yeah, so I think that's my challenge. I've gotten a lot better at, at keeping my cool. But once in a while, I still lose it. And so um, that that's where I'm struggling the most. And I can relate to that so much. What have you found to be working when you do manage your emotions, keep your cool, check yourself? What happens there? Uh, so I always refer back to Hal's book, Screen Free Parenting, and, and that the, the their entire purpose is to make me better. So mm -hmm. I, I sort of become self-aware and I look at my kids and they're fighting and I tell myself they're fighting because their purpose is to make me better. And so then I just take a deep breath, check my ego, relax, and then come at it, at, you know, at it with an energy that is more um, sort of uh, bringing them together as opposed to just having a, a, a big blow up and making things worse. Um, that's what I've found. But again, I'm imperfect and I've told my kids and I apologize to them when I do blow up. I'm working on myself, but I'm getting better at less blow ups. And, and what do you think is the consequence of them, you know, if they bicker, like part of what I have found, and I wonder if this is the same for you too, is like, I have a fear 
under the anger. Like most of the time behind anger is fear, right? So I, if it were me, I would be watching my kids fight and I have this fear that if they don't figure it out, like they're going to miss this great opportunity to be great siblings. Or I have a fear that I have not somehow created the right structure for them to have a great relationship or that, um, that it will ruin the day and that it will ruin your, your wife's experience, you know, as an example. And I have all these fears and that creates anger for me. Do you find the same for you? Yeah, absolutely. So I have this blueprint, this, uh, what I envision how it's supposed to happen yeah. Mother's Day, or I'll give you an example. About two months ago, my wife was out of town and I had this beautiful vision of, oh, I'm going to take both kids out for dinner. We're going to have great conversation. We're going to relax and have a beautiful meal and we're going to just have a wonderful time. And boom, that image is gone because yeah. they're blown up. They're uh, fighting. One refuses to get dressed to go out. Um, the other one walks out the door. It's just everything just get, got ruined, right? The, that fear of, oh, I got to preserve this because that was my intention. That's what I wanted to come, pull yeah. off. And now it's not going to happen. Yeah. Holding, holding on. For me, I hear holding on too tight to this, these expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, how about props? Who, who do you want to give some love to, man? Who in your life do you want to acknowledge uh, in any capacity. And again, it could be a front row dad. It could be somebody in your home, but just who's, who's really shining. My wife, she's amazing right now. Um, she, um, just supporting Dara through this last couple of weeks, uh, of losing Knox. Uh, she is an incredible mother. So kind, so loving, so patient really devoting a tremendous amount of time to comfort Dara. Um, she's just a beautiful soul. I am so lucky to be married to her. Um, meanwhile, she's got a lot going on as well. Um, uh, and she is working on herself like she's never worked before, harder than ever. Uh, and I just love seeing her progression and her commitment to being better every day and that I think that's why we're so connected is we both are trying to feverishly work to get better every day. So I, I love her um, props are just, she's amazing right now. She's on fire. That's great. I love that. Um, I think that hearing men, hearing you right now, uh, give praise to your wife, I think gives men a reminder to do the same I was on a hike recently in Phoenix with a couple of front row dads climbing up Camelback Mountain. And I was like, oh, I had this awareness around my text messages to my son. And then I thought, what if all of us, so here's a, here's a challenge, ready to everybody listening. If I asked you to pull out your phone right now and go to your wife as an example, since we're talking about your wife, go look at all the messages. And over the last 100 messages that you've sent to your wife, how many of them are tasks? How many of them are critiques? How many of them are compliments, praise, love, acknowledgement? And uh, my bet is <laughs> that ratio uh, will be alarming yeah. to many. And, and we start to think about like, the text is just an example of like tracking our communication with people. Sure. But um, my hope is that in asking that question also, Ray, that that men will start to hear those words and start to look for maybe like, how are their wives showing up and that uh, that they could send a message today. That's your assignment, men. Send a message or speak that message to your wife of appreciation. I agree. Um, one of the greatest gifts that I got and I've I've given it to my wife is during one of the retreats and um four of us that you put together over dinner, we came up with the idea of a Thanksgiving journal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so 30 days before Thanksgiving, uh, last year I bought a journal and every single day I uh, made an entry uh, for that day as to why I was so grateful for my wife. And uh, uh, we were in Peru and on Thanksgiving morning, she came to breakfast. I, I always wake up early, so I was at breakfast earlier having coffee. Um, and I gave her the Thanksgiving journal wrapped in a, uh, you know, paper and a bow. Uh, and my daughter was, uh, using my phone to take a video. Um, 
it was just unbelievable uh, yeah. her reaction how just the smile that put on her face and then that night i went to sleep and i woke up um and she was right next to me reading the journal at two in the morning so, wow but that uh, props to you for bringing you know that sort of uh environment together and creating that environment the vulnerability of men coming together and coming up with these ideas how we can pour into our uh brides yeah i i think it's a great articulation about what happens at our events i mean it i think it's easy for sometimes people to hear oh a dad's retreat that's probably a bunch of dudes sitting around smoking cigars having beers and and bitching about their wives <laughs> like that's the <laughs> opposite of what happens yeah. at a front row dad's event um, there's a lot of personal responsibility. There's a lot of like, what can I do in order to right impact this marriage in a positive way? Um, so, and I love to hear that. Thank you, Ray. Uh, let's, let's try to, we can start to think about wrapping this conversation through, I think just talking a little bit more about you as a dad mm -hmm. and, I want to give a little space, as I said before, to talking about like, where else are you winning, man? Because that's to be a celebrated when you feel that, when you feel that you're in a season of having these moments. Um, I'd love to hear one more, maybe two more. Sure. Just what are you, what are you proud of right now? Yeah, I'm proud of, um, and you know this, and a lot of the men in our tribe know this, um, our um, passion is travel. Um, yeah. I was, I was, oh, dude, I was so glad you went here. I I wanted yeah. to go here. I was so passionate about travel before I got married, and then Catherine and I got married, and we traveled extensively before uh, we had children. And now, um, it's our family's focus. Uh, my kids at fourteen, nine, eleven have been to twenty-two countries. I've been to fifty. Uh, my wife's been to I think thirty-eight. Um, and I'm really proud of that. Uh, why? Um. So many reasons. Uh, so we're we're living in a world that's changing rapidly and becoming connected more than ever. Um, but at the same time, uh, due to all the social media and all that, it's we're more divided than ever. Uh, and I want my kids to grow up to be citizens of the world um, and be able to connect with people of all cultures and languages and so on. So it's incredible to see them grow and what they face and see, um, you know, from gaining confidence of how to, like if you dropped off my kids at an airport right now, anywhere in the world, they know how to get around, they know what, where to go to ask questions, they know how to get to their flight and so on. I mean, that in itself, giving them confidence is really critical. Um, you know, being in a foreign city, they don't speak the language and understanding how to get around. Um, constantly being aware of their surroundings, um, you know, just simple little things that gives the kids confidence. Um, American Airlines has these booklets, uh, they don't publish them anymore. And my wife bought a whole bunch of them where uh, for every flight you give it, to, uh, the kids give it to the uh, pilots and the pilots fill in the flight information, the number, where they're going, nautical miles and all that. So the booklets are like that thick now because of all the travel they've done. You should see the smiles on their faces when sometimes the actually the pilots come back and go, ah, you've traveled more than I have. You know, uh, that's cool. And it just gives them a lot of confidence um, and it makes them interesting. The more experiences we have in life, the more interesting we are, the more people we can connect. So when they are around friends and they're talking about, oh, you know, I've had guinea pig. I've eaten alpaca. I've eaten cow's heart. I've been in Peru. I've been to Machu Picchu. I've done, you know, so many different things. It just makes them interesting. Um, I think that that's a huge win for our family. We're going to continue to do that. Uh, their goal is to see a lot of countries. Um, I think, I think my son's at 50 before he goes off to college. So wow, we got a lot to go and, and that's really our passion. We travel and they go to a public school. So we don't, it's not like we homeschool, we can just pack up and go. So we always travel during spring break. Um, summer, we have a big vacation. And, and each summer, by the way, one of the kids gets to choose. So in June, we're going to Romania because my yes. daughter, Darina, chose that. Um, because she has a friend in school who's Romanian. She, by the way, planned the whole thing. She spent all the time researching of where to go, what to see. She put together the itinerary. And then my wife kind of helps her, you know, finalize everything. Um, so we got a summer and then we got last year we over Thanksgiving and then over Christmas and New Year's. 
Um, so that's something that I'm very proud of and exposing my kids to the world. And But also the other critical thing is when when things happen that are, are out of their control, how do, how do they deal with it? When we have flight cancellations, flight delays, uh, how do they deal with that? How do they deal with the customer service? They observe dad. Um, and I'll give you a quick, perfect example. Uh, we were headed to Dominican Republic our, and we were connecting through Miami. Our flight got delayed in Dallas. We missed our connection. By the time we got to the American Airlines guest services, there was a huge line of everybody on our flight who was also connecting to go to Dominican. Every I observed as I was last in line with my kids, I observed every single person yelling and screaming at the agent. And she said, I'm sorry, you got to spend the night. The next flight is the, tomorrow morning. I get there. I befriend her. I'm kind. She puts us on the flight later that afternoon. We get to Dominican on the same day. Yeah, <laughs> kids see that. Right? Yeah, you totally, know, totally. They're seeing dad not lose his cool, treat somebody respectfully, and then, oh, my God, look at what dad got. We get to go today because he was kind to the customer service agent. These are all experiences through travel. Um, and then lastly, I'll tell you, and I've posted this on the on, on the uh, Telegram. Sometimes the kids like want ice cream, and I say, you got to earn it. And so one time in Spain, I bought out the vendor who was selling long stem roses, and I yeah. said, um, you have to give it to, uh, you know, older ladies, you have to give out all the roses before I give you ice cream. And so she, they did that and it was just magical. And then we were in Italy and I bought out a vendor of balloons and they gave out all the balloons to kids. So I do these games with them. Uh, and again, it's, it's just all about experiences of, of, you know, through travel. So. Did you, I love, I love hearing these stories, Ray, because they also remind me of some of my favorite moments with my family that I haven't thought of since you just mentioned that. I had this one moment with Ocean where I bought, he wanted a balloon, but I was like, uh, I will buy two and you have to give one away. Yeah. And I remember this moment of just like him looking at this other kid and he walked over and he gave him a balloon. And I'm like, that was so much better than just buying Ocean a balloon. Exactly. And, um, and then I remember going to an arcade with him and I got him coins and I said, I'll buy, he goes, can I have the hundred coins? And I said, yes, as long as every time you play a game, you give away a coin. So the entire time we're in the arcade, he plays the game and I'm like, now you got to go give one away. And he walks up to a kid and he hands it. So the entire day was him giving coins away to kids <laughs> that, that those moments they'll never forget. And, and those are the yeah. greatest lessons. Um, and I, I have many examples of that as well, where the kids learn that it's, it's so wonderful to give. Yeah, right? totally. And the impact that they can have on people. Yeah. I love that, man. Um, really fun. Uh, Ray, where do you want to go, man? Where's what's on your travel hit list? Where, where, what's on your, you know, I'd say the next like two to three places that you're you're hungry for. Well, there's one for me, and that's Antarctica. I want to go there for sure. But uh, as a family, um, definitely want to hit some more African countries and go to a safari. Mm -hmm. That's like number one on our list. Uh, so we got to try to make arrangements around that. Um, I, I definitely want to go to Japan and Korea. Uh, I've been to Southeast Asia, but not Japan and Korea. Uh, and probably, um, you know, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and, and Finland. Those are the countries that I want to visit. That's great. Uh, you know who, um, have you, have you talked to Stathi from, uh, from our VIP crew about travel to the, uh, to do the safaris? Has he told you about that? No. He'd be a guy. He's done that and really loved it. Yeah. And maybe somebody else who's not coming to mind right now, but Stathi for sure. Yeah. If you want um, to get any inside scoop on his his journey, yeah, I will do yeah. that. Ray, there are most most of the time when somebody joins Front Row Dads, it, it's usually a guy in our group who who connects them to Front Row Dads. You know, they're like, "Hey, man, I think you'd like this community. Check it out." And then oftentimes they also will say, "Hey, why don't you just listen to the podcast for a little bit?" Mm -hmm. And so. For anybody that's listening that is thinking about joining Front Row Dads, um, what would you tell them, you know, about your experience speaking from the heart? Uh, if somebody's on the fence, 
and and also feel free to speak to like why not to join if because I don't think everybody is a perfect fit for front row dads. So just how might somebody go about making that decision in your mind? So it it I think if the individual is not committed to growing, I don't think there would be a wise decision to join. Yeah. You have to want to invest in yourself uh, and have the attitude that you want to get better as a, as a husband and as a father, uh, first and foremost. Uh, obviously, we have other pillars as well. But um, And if, if, if that is your goal, this is your tribe. Uh, these are all, but you have to come in and be vulnerable, be authentic, be genuine, pour into others, um, those are, that's, what's going to make you successful in this environment. Um, and I just cannot rave enough about it. Uh, the men that I've met and the connections I've made, the discussions and the conversations I've had have been so incredibly powerful. Um, they've shaped me as to who I am going back to how I've evolved, how I've become an extrovert and more confident in myself as a husband, as a dad, as a businessman, as an individual, um, all of it goes back to being surrounded by men who are pushing to get better every day. Right. Thanks for, thanks for sharing your heart today, brother. Um, it was exactly what I thought it would be a real conversation, um, you know, we're talking about the stuff that might be a little heavier in life and we're celebrating the things that, um, in many cases are well-earned uh, you're, um, a wonderful human brother, really like so good to be around you. I can't wait to just keep creating these memories with you. And, uh, you, you're, you inspire me to want to do like, um, to evolve our events for you. Cause I just want to keep, you know, creating the menu and watching you walk in and, and experience that. So thanks for leaning in, man. Thanks for trusting in me and the guys, uh, and this brotherhood. So, um, yeah, man, this has been a great conversation. Thanks, Ray. Thank you so much, John. Um, I shared with you that on the last retreat that you have created an incredible environment. Um, and it always, is the leader who sets the tone. Uh, so I commend you for everything you've accomplished, uh, the men and the caliber of the individuals you've brought together um, and the far reaching impact you're having. Because every day we're impacting our children, our, our spouses, our relationships, our employees, our parents, our siblings, our neighbors, our community. And it all starts because John Broman had this vision of bringing men together. Um, so thank you so much for everything you've done. Mm. And mess, I received that. Thank you. All right, brother. Well, that's it for today. Um, Thank you, thanks again. All right.